Uh, now, on those strikes, let's start with the strikes. The RMT says it will bring the country to a standstill in the most widespread walkout for decades starting on Tuesday. Now, that, of course, is the UK's airports and airlines remain in chaos as staff shortages lead to hundreds of flight cancellations and huge delays. It really does add to that sense of a looming summer of travel misery. Problematic, of course, for the Transport Secretary, Grant Schatz, who joins us now. Thank you very much for being uh, with us, Mr Schatz. So we now know that next week's strikes will go ahead. What is the impact going to be? I think it's a huge mistake. Um, unfortunately, uh, the unions, Mick Lynch, the RMT, have been gunning for this strike throughout. Um, they Back in April, they called the strike on the false pretense with their members uh, of taking themselves off the pay freeze, which, of course, the whole of the public services had uh, for the past couple of years. Uh, that pay freeze was coming to an end anyway. The strikes are completely unnecessary. It's going to inconvenience millions of people, students doing their GCSEs and A-levels, 17 different public exams, in fact. People trying to get to hospitals to try to uh, get to operations, perhaps that have been postponed during coronavirus. It is disastrous, uh, and it's no way um, to behave on the railway. Uh, there's no advantage uh, to this. Uh, I know that Mick Lynch says he's, uh, quote, nostalgic for union power, but this is no way to behave. Uh, you uh, say there that you know it, they were wrongly uh, saying that there's going to be a pay freeze, but at the same time, do you not have any sympathy for workers who are being hit by a massive cost of living crisis? Um, if you look at the reports, uh, my understanding uh, from these reports seems to be that the pay offer is around 2.5%. Inflation is projected to hit 11% this year. It, people, wages are not going to keep up, are they? I'm very, I'm very concerned for everybody's um, incomes and people who won't be able to get to work as well next week. But let me just put this in context. The railway has had £16 billion, that's £600 per household in this country in emergency funding to keep it going throughout the coronavirus to make sure that not a single employee of the railways uh, had to be furloughed or lost their job. So the taxpayer, we've all done our part. Uh, a train driver has paid, on average, medium salary, £59,000, a nurse, £31,000, a care worker, £21,000. Just to come back in, Mr Chaps, because you are uh, picking just the train drivers here. We know that these strikes are not just train drivers, is it? The There's a lot more people yeah. on much lower salaries than that working mm. on the uh, yeah. on the railways, aren't there, to be You're fair? Right, but the overall medium pay is £44,000. Um, so this is, this is not a badly paid industry. I want people to be paid more. What we need is modernisation of some very antiquated working practices which stretch back not just to the 70s but in in some cases to 1919 which is the re re regard to uh, the failure to be able to run trains on on sundays the world has changed the hospitality market has come back it's the one bit which has been quite busy on the railways and we need to change the modernize the the railways so all we're asking for is modernization in return uh, for uh, for pay. Uh, and I think that's a very reasonable thing to ask for. Uh, I think the public realise we can't carry on putting the likes of £16 billion in. That's £160,000 of support per individual uh, worker on the railway uh, over uh, the last couple of years. We can't carry on doing that. So we've got to have a, a reasonable negotiation. And my big complaint is yesterday afternoon, as these negotiations were ongoing, uh, Mick Lynch and the RMT walked out and went to a TUC rally instead. They're gunning for this strike, I'm afraid, uh, and it's going to inconvenience millions of Brits. Um, just uh, quickly, um, you say you, all you want to see is modernisation. Is that just code for job cuts? Well, no. I, I'll give you a really good example. Um, you no, know no that cuts. obviously the safety... No job cuts the, coming. Well, hold on, let me let me explain. I'll give you a really good example. Uh, the safety of the railway is incredibly important, obviously. Um, at the moment, it involves people going out and walking along the track too often, which is dangerous. And I'm afraid I uh, just recently read uh, one of the accident uh, reports of somebody who was killed on the track. We, we I'm afraid, have, have deaths every year through this. Actually, a train fitted with sensors can take 70,000 images per minute and drones can do the overhead wires and is far safer than sending people on the tracks. It requires technology rather than people. And so, yes, we do need to reshape the workforce. Um, but uh, as I say, okay. what's happening at the moment is the unions are stopping that modernisation, not making the railways any safer. What does that mean? That means job cuts, doesn't it? Let's just talk in plain English. Reshaping we, we the workforce to... means some job cuts, right? 
We need to reshape the railway around the needs of the railway today. Does, it mean, does that, that mean cuts. job cuts? We've, we've been asking for voluntary and getting voluntary uh, redundancies. So we don't require uh, everybody in their current role. But if I can explain the way that things are set so up. How many job moment, losses are you railway, expecting? So if you let me just let me just let me finish this one point. The way things are set up in the railway at the moment is like trying to conduct an orchestra, but you don't know whether the musicians will uh, to be able to sort of sit where they need to sit, whether they're going to turn up, whether they're going to bring their instruments. The inflexibilities are built into the contracts. We need modernization on our railways to be able to run them efficiently, more safely, and in the interest of passengers. So how many job cuts are you looking to, to get? Well, there's already been 2,700 voluntary uh, redundancies. Uh, what we know is that we, uh, what, I, what I'm interested in is running an efficient railway, uh, making sure we can run the trains on time, uh, not uh, running railways based on old, How outdated practices. Uh, I don't know the exact. Uh, I don't know the exact number, but what we're looking to do is make sure the railway runs for passengers. And just to, because I see where you're going here, just to re-emphasise one thing. We are expanding our railways. I'm opening lines which were cut in the 60s and 70s under the beaching cuts. We're building new railways in the, the, you know, the Northern Powerhouse Rail, HS2 and, and, and elsewhere. So we're expanding our railways. It's not a question of making them smaller. Uh, what I'm more interested in is how to run them properly rather than keeping positions exactly as they were throughout history, which is not working for our railway. OK. Uh, now, you haven't met with the RMT since the 13th of May. They want to meet with you. Why won't you meet with them? Because the negotiations need to take place with the employers. Those are the people who have the power to uh, settle this. Uh, Mick Lynch and the RMT know this. It's a stunt that at the 11th hour, they're suddenly saying they want to meet up. In fact, only last month, the unions were saying they would not negotiate with the government. They would refuse to meet, as Mick Lynch put it, with a Tory government, his words. Uh, as I say, they balloted for this action in April before the pay offer was even on the table under false pretenses, telling their members that they weren't going to get a, a pay rise without it, which was totally untrue. And yesterday, they thought it was more important to attend a TUC rally than carry on talking. I think it tells you everything that you need to know about this. I won't undermine these talks uh, by getting in between the employer and the employees, the unions. OK, um, you say that you don't want to undermine the talks, it's not for the government to get involved, but you know there are claims that actually the train operating, operating companies can't negotiate fully uh, because at the minute, because of the emergency um, uh, measures agreements agreed during COVID, the government effectively bankrolls the railways. So you set the kind of financial framework, the caps, if you like, the ceilings under which these negotiations can take place. With that in mind, should the government not be in the talks uh, if you are the one setting the ceilings? Uh, no, I, I, it is true to say that the taxpayer is bankrolling the, the railways. So that's absolutely true to say. Um, but the uh, train operating companies, through something called the Rail Delivery Group and Network Rail, uh, they have the authorities to uh, carry out the negotiations. You can't carry out them out if the t if the RMT union has left the table to go to a rally. Uh, but they is have, it right uh, that the government has set the pay ceilings? Of course, there's a. This is no secret. There's a. There's a national um, pay approach taken by the chancellor across the uh, public sector. I've said that if we can get the modernisation that this railway desperately needs and get rid of these working practices that, for example, mean that if somebody's taking a break, a twenty minute break, and the manager happens to walk past and say, "Hi, Bob." than the person taking the break can restart the 20 minutes from scratch because they were interrupted. So if you are, just to come, so if the government is setting the pay ceilings, it's fair that you should be involved in the negotiations, isn't it? If, you know, the RMT are concerned about the pay the, of their workers. The, no, and, and, the, and the trade unions know that only the employer and the trade union can settle this. Um, to explain, uh, these talks have been ongoing for a long time. There are about 20 different areas of detailed uh, and I have to say, in some cases, very productive work going on that modernisation uh, uh, in, in, in such levels of detail that only an employer could possibly have those negotiations. I will not cut across that. I will not undermine the employer's work. I'm afraid this is a stunt at the 11th hour by the union, whilst they're off holding a rally, suddenly coming forward and saying, oh, we need to negotiate with the government now, even though, as I said just last month, 
they were telling me they wouldn't be seen dead negotiating with the uh, with the government. Okay. The correct thing to happen um, is a point you've already made, um, Mr. Chaps. Um, next week, obviously, as, uh, could be just the start of the strike. So the RMT is, is saying that you know they'll be looking at potentially uh, at more action throughout the summer as well. If these strikes are ongoing, if they could last for days, what would the consequences be? I mean, we've talked about you know the lights potentially going out. Is that a possibility? No, I don't think we'll see that. And uh, even whilst these strikes are ongoing, we'll see uh, freight being moved around, perhaps 50% of the normal levels. Um, but I would say this, you know, I, I hear that you know, the leadership of this quite militant union is nostalgic for the old type of union power they had. They don't seem to realise the world's changed. We've been through coronavirus. Travelling by train was a necessity for millions of people before. Um, now it's optional for a lot of those passengers who we've desperately been trying to get back onto the railway. Um, things have changed. People can more often work from home. The people I'm really upset for, people actually like my daughter who need to get to their A-levels next week, um, students, pupils, people trying to get to hospitals, those are the people who are going to suffer. Actually, key workers, often lower paid workers who can't do their work from home. That's who the RMT is damaging and it's completely unacceptable. Earlier this week, you told railway workers that you risk striking yourselves out of a job. Um, it sounds a bit like a threat. No, it's a statement of reality, right? The, the railways have been on this £16 billion life support, the equivalent roughly of the entire police budget in the country for the year. That's how much money we put in, £600 per household. Of course, it's a reality that if we can't get these railways modernised, if we can't get uh, the kind of efficiency that will mean that they can work on behalf of the travelling um, public, then of course it's jeopardising the future of the uh, railway itself. I think it's a huge act of self-harm to go on strike at the moment. I don't believe workers are anywhere near as militant as their unions who are leading them up a garden path. Uh, they're gunning for the strike. Uh, it's completely unnecessary. There's a sensible pay deal. There's a sensible, I think, modernisation of the railway, which would enable a much more flexibility uh, and much more automation and much safer railway. Uh, but the unions need to understand the world has changed and people don't need to necessarily travel as they did in the past, which is um, unfortunate. Um, we want people back at work, as the government's been um, saying. Uh, we think it's a better environment, but people, many people will be able to function from home and the unions don't seem to realise that people don't need the product in, in quite the same way as they once did. Now, the government is uh, looking at changing some legislation around strikes, so uh, allowing companies to cover striking workers with agency staff, also potentially increasing the maximum damages that businesses can claim for illegal strikes uh, up to a million pounds. Is that correct and how quickly could it be brought in? Yeah, that's correct. Um, minimum service levels as well, which was in our manifesto, which would mean that certain levels of service would need to be maintained even on a, a strike day. Uh, what you describe as agency workers coming in is, is slightly incorrect. What we're actually talking about is, uh, for example, if you had somebody in an operations room at the moment, they can be looking at one screen. They won't move around to another screen because uh, the union rules forbid it as it happens unless you make them a payment at which point they say it's safe and they can do it uh, what we're talking about is re requiring that kind of flexibility so it's more transferable skills uh, than it is agency work um, in, in this case uh, and a range of other things as i say much of which really doesn't need to happen if we could just get to a sensible settlement here uh, but i'm afraid they, they are gunning for this um, strike as we've seen by them walking out of the talks yesterday to attend a rally okay. uh, unfortunately i think therefore okay. we need to protect the traveling public um, I want to talk to you a bit about what's happening at the airports as well. Uh, anyone who has been uh, on holiday or, or travelled recently will have seen firsthand the chaos uh, that is going on. Um, Gatwick have said it's going to reduce capacity in the summer, which means more cancelled flights. Are you concerned that other uh, airports could do the same thing? And how long could we see this going on for? Well, we've certainly seen a difficult bounce back. Uh, you'll recall both um, at Easter, but also at the Whitson uh, holidays, those those scenes. Uh, we've said to the aviation sector, that can't carry on. Uh, and uh, we have a working group set up with them, which is meeting all of the time, working very closely with the aviation um, sector. Uh, we have a series of different uh, things that we're going to be um, putting in place and ask them to do. One of which was to ask them to review their schedules now, not on the day of the flight or the day before, where they destroy somebody's holiday, but in 
advance. And actually, I, I welcome uh, what Gatwick have done to sensibly look at the schedule and see whether it could actually be fulfilled uh, and give people notice now rather than in six weeks time, five weeks time, uh, which is what they've, they've done. I think that's smart. We'll be coming forward with some further um, ideas to help alleviate um, pressure. Fundamentally, of course, it's down to the industry. They need to make sure they employ people, get them in the right places. This reminds me a lot of the problem that we had with a shortage of lorry uh, drivers, which we fixed through 33 different measures uh, that the government and the sector brought together, uh, brought forward together. And I'd like to do the same with the aviation sector. What uh, kind to of thing are you looking at then? Flows. Um, well, uh, to give you to give you one example, something we already did, which was make it easier and faster to employ people, get them through the security referencing system. Um, so we made a change in the law there and some technical changes to make it easier to do that. Uh, and, and there are more measures along those types of lines from a government point of view. Uh, and then from an industry point of view, things like them looking at their schedule as they've done is very helpful. But we'll be saying more about this actually in the coming week. Uh, I'll say more about this. Um, but I, we're, we're watching it like a hawk, working very closely with the aviation sector. They had a stop start two years. I understand how they've got to this position. What we need to do is fix it for uh, holiday makers and people who want to travel by air um, this summer. It feels, um, just looking at the jobs market a bit more widely, um, it feels like we're in a strange situation where it's almost as if the jobs market is a bit too hot. I mean, we've got 1.3 million vacancies in the labour market. The issue, of course, is getting people to fill the jobs. Um, Paul Scully, uh, the minister, uh, told Sky News this uh, week that the answer could be trying to get people to be a bit more productive. So if they're part time, seeing if they want to work more hours. He was talking about people who have recalibrated what they want to do when on furlough. Do you agree with him? All I would say, actually, is I, I think the solution in aviation, as in the rest of the economy, is actually not dissimilar to the way that we've solved, uh, or on our way to solving, I should probably say, the HGV lorry crisis, which was causing so many problems, you remember, even including with tankers at the <clears throat> petrol pumps. Uh, and we did that by looking at the entire market for those em employees paying a little bit more actually often that was at the at the very heart of it making sure people were attracted to the industry just this week i've launched something called generation logistics so i think those are the types of things which help to resolve this problem in as you, what you described is an incredibly tight jobs market i did listen to your introduction actually and you were saying oh it's a bit like the 70s well the big difference is unemployment was a, a big problem uh certainly later in the 70s uh, what we've got now is an economy which is um, fortunately very very high level of employment and very low unemployment. So I do think continuously skilling people up, uh, more automation, um, uh, uh, things like that help with um, productivity, but also just making sure that each sector is attractive enough to go into. Uh, and if you look at baggage handlers, for example, I don't think they've had the best deals and the best packages uh, in the past. I think we've got to make those jobs uh, worthwhile, well paid uh, and, uh, and, and comfortable jobs to do. A bit more attractive uh, to encourage people to do them understood. Yeah. Um, just finally, during Boris Johnson's leadership campaign, uh, you were famously the man with the spreadsheet. You predicted to the number, uh, the number of uh, Conservative MPs who were going to back uh, Boris Johnson's leadership campaign. During the recent confidence vote, when 148 MPs uh, voted against uh, Boris Johnson, did Number 10 call on your services again? Well, I did make a prediction, but I have to say, actually, it's a, it's a statistical prediction. So, in fact, so how uh, that doesn't tell you... Was it, was it correct? It, it, did it, you get it, it on the money it, again? I did, um, but, but... but You uh, did get it on the... Uh, you got say, it on, you, you, wait, sorry. You, so you correctly predicted 148 MPs again? Um, one out, in fact. But, uh, but, but uh, I should point out, it's not as useful as it sounds. It's not as good as it sounds. It's a statistical prediction rather than a um, individuals who voted specifically in, in one way uh, or the other. So I do not want to overplay uh, the uh, the advantage of this because most whips would want to know who was involved, whereas my outsider looking in uh, version of it was uh, look. This is the picture as as, as I see it. Yeah, on the fun, subject though. itself, since you're... getting 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 just one out. You did much better than number 10, who was seemingly predicting, you know, far less uh, MPs uh, were going to rebel than they did. Did you tell Boris Johnson about your prediction? Did you warn him? 
Well, look, I'm not going to sort of get into the sort of details of the conversation. What I was going to say, though, is um, speaking to even some of those who didn't support the prime minister a couple of weeks ago, uh, which I've done some of the some of the, the the names which would be most recognisable with people who've been critical. Everyone now is in the mood of let's give uh, the prime minister the opportunity, the space, the time to uh, make sure that he can carry on with some of the uh, work that he's doing. We just saw him in Kiev uh, a couple of days ago, uh, and as President Zelensky um, says, where Britain goes other fo others follow with regard to uh, the war in ukraine i think he's showing great international leadership there it's going to help us get through uh, these challenges that we're facing at home including um things like um cost of living and some of the things we've been doing on the railways prior to the strikes like making sure that we we have offers available for people to buy, to, to attract people back to the railways through the through the sale and, and, and many many other things high employment levels these are the things which really matter to people so you know i, I just think uh, I, I agree with some with some of those who, who didn't support the prime minister we need to give uh, the opportunity uh, for this government to do what it was elected to do notwithstanding that it had two years of um, a huge uh, health crisis to deal with as well. And looking back on that, the Prime Minister got us the injections first, the jabs first, got us out of lockdown first okay. in the world. And those things are things that this Prime Minister okay. achieved above anybody else. Understood. We are out of time. Uh, Grant Chaps, uh, thank you very much for being on the programme this morning. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, we know where the government stands on the strikes. Grant Chaps made that Pretty clear. But what about Labour? The RMT has called on Keir Starmer to stand firmly with workers in what its general secretary sees as a class war. He's asked, which side are you on? Well, let's try and find out. We're joined by the Shadow Leveling Up secretary, Lisa Nandy. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, Lisa Nandy, which side are you on? Morning. Well, I'm on the side of the people who are building and creating and driving this country, whether they work on the railways or they're trying to use the railways to get to work. Of course, we don't want strikes to have to go ahead this week. I live in the north of England. We've had 10 years of underfunding, bad management and broken promises on the railways. And we know what it means when the railways grind to a halt. But that's why the government has got to get round the table with the cleaners and the ticket office staff and the station workers to resolve this because they're the only people who can. Only a few years ago, Grant Chaps was calling them true heroes. Now he's refusing to meet them. The government hasn't lifted a finger since March to engage in those talks. And during the pandemic, they took the right to negotiate back from the train operating companies. So they're the only people who can resolve this, and yet they're not prepared to do it. The biggest problem that this country has is not militant workers, it's a militant government. You say that you don't want to see the strikes um, happen, but of course... You know, anyone would say that, you know, the RMT would say that, the government would say that. It, it's effectively a bit kind of meaningless. Um, Wes Struting has said previously that if he was a member of the RMT, then he would vote for industrial action. Would you? Well, I would, I, what, I, I'm not a member of the RMT. What I am is a member of parliament aspiring to form the next government. And I can tell you what we would do in government. We would get round the table with the workers that Grant Shapps was calling true heroes only a couple of years ago and listen seriously to their concerns. So it's not pay just rise, that they've had If they want a pay rise of, pay of 11%, cuts, would you... It's also that they've got serious safety would concerns you agree to that? about what is happening on the railways. And that is exactly what the Welsh Government did. Uh, that the reason that you have haven't got strikes in Wales and you have got strikes in England is because in Wales you've got a Labour government and in England you've got a Tory government. It's not about whether workers go on strike, it's about the fact that we've got a government that is currently on strike and not doing its job. And it's pretty clear that you obviously want uh, the government to get around the table um, and you want you see negotiation as the way forward but I'm just trying to kind of get to grips with in the current situation, where, where, where your sympathies effectively are. You know, Mick Lynch, who we'll be talking to uh, in a moment, he previously told me that Keir Starmer hasn't made it clear uh, that he's on the side of the workers. If we just get this bland Democratic Party sitting in the centre of politics, taking their instructions off the Daily Mail to some extent, not getting behind workers' struggles, you have to ask yourself, why do they call themselves the Labour Party? What would you say to that? 
Well, what I would say to that is that I want a government that actually delivers for all of its working people. These are the people who built this country, who kept us going during the pandemic, whether they work in the private sector and are trying to get to work on the railways or work in the public sector, trying to help people get to work on the railways. I want a government that delivers, and that is what Labour stands for. This government stands against all of those people. Only this weekend, they were briefing out to the media that they'd had a good week, a wedge week, they were calling it, because presumably they've been able to pit worker against worker, which is how they plan to maintain themselves in power. I'm calling it out because Grant Chaps has got some brass neck to come on your programme when this government is presiding over soaring inflation rates, the highest in 30 years, and has no plan to tackle the cost of living. They've dragged their feet on it for months, and they've got no plan to get growth back into the economy. This is a government that in 2019 came to power on a promise to level up, and instead what they've presided over is absolute chaos. Chaos at the ports, chaos on the railways, chaos at airports, chaos everywhere you go, and that is because this is a government that is not doing its job. Uh, talking to Grant Shapps earlier, you just specifically talking about the strikes uh, still, you know, the RMT want pay rises to keep uh, pace with uh, inflation. You know, for many people who this pay is not going to be ri rising like anything like that, that's going to seem uh, like a pretty tall order. He also made the point about the amount of money that taxpayers are currently pouring into the railways. Uh, Four-fifths of the £21 billion cost of Britain's railways works out about £600 per household. Uh, is it not right that there are efficiency savings that have to be made on the railways effectively fewer people use them? Well, the efficiency savings that are being driven largely, actually, by frontline staff who can see where there's waste and are trying to take action to deal with it. I don't think it's an efficiency saving, though, to say you want to take a guard off a train. I'm not sure when Grant Chaps last got on a train, but the railways are fast becoming no-go areas for many, many people, people with disabilities, older people, people in uh, women particularly travelling late at night. You know, in the north of England, we remember this well. We had uh, the IRA bombs in Manchester and Warrington um, when I was growing up. We had, we've had a, a terrorist attack at the Manchester Arena. In the face of all of that, the government should not be calling it efficiency savings to take skilled, experienced staff off the railways who help to keep us safe. That is why his interview with you, Sophie, was so utterly disingenuous. Because what he really knows is that the repeated amount of cuts that he's trying to make to the railways don't just harm the people who work on them, they harm the travelling public as well. OK. Um, now, Keir Starmer has submitted his questionnaire to Durham Police. Um, so if he's found guilty of Covid rule breaches, we know that he said uh, that he will uh, resign. According to the Sunday Times, he's been doing a bit of succession planning, just in case that happens, not assuming that it's going to happen, but just in case. Apparently telling friends, I will not let this party become a basket case again. Now, the Times reports it's understood that he has since met a number of members of his shadow cabinet with leadership ambitions and has urged them to put campaign teams in place. Has he spoken to you? It's absolute nonsense. No, he hasn't. And I've spoken to him twice in the last couple of days about how we persuade this government to lift a finger to avert a crisis on the railways. Bit, are you a bit worried uh, he's been talking to West Streeting and not you then? Local government funding. Sorry, sir, are you, sorry again. Are you a bit worried he's been talking to West Streeting and not you? But no, I'm not worried that he's been talking to anybody about succession planning because I know that he's been talking to all of us about how we rid this country of a government that has held us back for the last 12 years and finally start to deliver for working people. That, that is the conversation that we're having in the Labour Party at the moment. Our eyes are not on the Labour Party. For too long, we spent time debating the Labour Party. We care about the country. That's what we're in politics for and that's what we're discussing. There are, you say that, you know, we're all discussing about politics, but there is obviously um, discussions going on in Shadow Cabinet that are perhaps a little bit less uh, favourable. Um, lots of reports that members of the Shadow Cabinet have been telling Keir Starmer to stop being so boring, uh, leaking stories to the media. He apparently addressed it in Shadow Cabinet uh, and effectively told them to stop. What is going on? Is that true? 
No, we're completely focused on what is happening in the country at the moment because we live in it and we couldn't care more about the fact that at the moment you've got a lot of people, not just some people now, but most people who really can't make ends meet. I can't remember a time when people worked this hard and then got home at the end of the week or the month and found that they couldn't keep their heads above water. The soaring inflation rates aren't just causing problems for families, they're causing problems for businesses as well. And every bit of our energy is going into not just being an opposition to this appalling government, but to being a genuine alternative so that come the next general election, we can finally move forwards as a country and start to get money back into communities, good jobs back into communities, money back into people's pockets and get this country working again. If every bit of your energy is focused on that, on becoming the alternative to the government, why haven't you got more eye-catching policies? Is the problem not that Keir Starmer is too boring, but that your policies are a bit too boring? Well, look, I'm standing here in Warwick today at the Labour Local Government Conference where Keir and I are setting out plans to smash up a century of centralisation and to get power back into local hands and into communities where it belongs. We've done it before in government through the regional development agencies. We were able to bring advanced manufacturing jobs to Rotherham. We were able to bring wind energy jobs to Grimsby. Now there are kids in Grimsby who are powering the world from the Gr Grimsby docks, getting money back into people's pockets and money back into the local community. That's what we're going to do again. It is bold, it is ambitious, but it's also um, not any more ambitious than people in this country are for themselves, their families, their lives and their communities. And they deserve a government that will meet that level of ambition. This one's not going to do it, so we are. OK, Lisa Nandy, thank you uh, very much. Lisa Nandy there. Well... Uh, let's uh, continue talking about those rail strikes now. The RMT union says it will bring the country to a standstill. The first of a number of walkouts across the network will start on Tuesday. Just 20% of the normal timetable of services is expected to be provided and there will be knock-on disruption for many days. Well, let's speak now to the General Secretary of the RMT, Mick Lynch. Thank you very much for being with us. I am very interested to get your reaction to both of the interviews we've heard this morning. But first... You know, for a lot of our viewers, you are the face of the stress, the disruption that they're going to face next week, whether that is you know, children trying to go to exams, whether it's adults trying to get to work or hospital appointments, whether it's people, hundreds of thousands of people trying to go to Glastonbury. What would you say to them? Well, we don't want to be the cause of the disruption in people's lives. We want a settlement to this dispute, but we're facing a crisis for our members. We're faced with thousands of job cuts, despite what Grant Shapp says. There's been no uh, guarantee that these redundancies won't be compulsory. We've seen uh, four or 5,000 jobs already go from the railway. They've told our maintenance staff uh, on, rail, on Network Rail that the 3,000 jobs will go. They're cut, going to cut back on the safety regime. They've told us that every single booking office in Britain will close. They've told us that they're going to extend the working week from 35 hours to 40 or possibly 44, and for new entrants that will mean lower wages. So they're actually proposing pay cuts, not a pay rise, and an increase in working time on the railway. And if that's the way the rest of the society is going to go, that you have to work more hours for less money, we've got a real crisis in this country, because it means they're trying to restore profit in a way that makes workers pay for that, uh, through their pay, pay bills and through their uh, wage slips, and through the amount of time they're going to spend in the workplace. At the same time, though, a lot of people work more than 35 hours a week and a lot of people are going to be facing, in fact, most of it is a, a real terms pay cut because of inflation. Are you not asking for special treatment here? No, we're not asking for special treatment. We've had pay cuts. We, most of our members have not had a pay rise for two to three years. I'm talking about actual pay cuts, the reduction of salaries, as well as the losses against uh, the rate of inflation, which uh, has been said is 11% at the moment. So it's not just a losing out against the cost of living. They're actually proposing to cut pay on the railway going forward. That was a proposal to put to us by the train operating companies on Thursday. And since that time, they've not invited us to any meetings whatsoever. Just, 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 just to be clear on this, because uh, the reports that I've read uh, are saying uh, that the train operating companies are offering around 2.5% pay rise. They've made no offer. And you uh, are gunning for 11% uh, pay no. rise. Is that true? Neither of those things okay, are true. So what is true? The train operating companies have made no offer at all right. during these talks. There are two, two strands of talks. Network Rail have got a strand, which is about half the people, and the train operators. 
The train operators adjourned the meeting on Thursday. They've not invited us to any talks whatsoever and they've made no offer on pay. And what, what they've what, told what, us what, is what, what they what, plan to do. And what are you looking for on pay? We're looking for a, a pay rise that reflects the cost of living. So what does that mean? Well, at Just the time... Let's, let's be really clear. Yeah, what what are time, you asking for? At the time of the network rail pay deal that should have been done in December, it was 7.1%, the retail price index. Let's not forget that those members didn't get a pay rise last year either. So is that what you're looking for? Well, that's, what, we're, that's what the cost of living would have been at the time these deals should have been struck. So we're going to negotiate to see if we can get a deal that reflects that cost of living. There are a number of ways which you can put value into a package. It's not all about straightforward pay. So we'll talk to them constructively, but they're making offers that are nowhere near that. And for half the people in the Institute, there's no offer at all. And for many of them, it's the third year where there's no offer and no proposal. Now, Grant Shapps makes a point about the amount of taxpayers' money that is going into the railways currently, right? Uh, and of course, we know through COVID that uh, the taxpayers have to bankroll uh, the railways uh, and also less people going to the office. And so uh, around 75%, I think, uh, is the sort of capacity on the railways. He says, you know, the government has spent uh, £16 billion on railways since the start of the pandemic, £600 per household. Are you not effectively asking taxpayers to bankroll no, salaries? we're not. That £16 billion was at the, uh, the peak of COVID when there are only 3 or 4% of people travelling on the railway. Our members worked through that and they, the government insisted that the railways be kept open. We worked with them on that and that was the last time I met Grant Shapps to talk about working practices and the way that we could keep the railway open. So when they say we didn't get furlough, the reason we didn't get furloughed is we kept working every day, every shift, seven days a week. I think the point he's making is that actually yeah. we're talking about taxpayers... I'll come to that. So at that time there was, the there was a subsidy, but let's not forget, during that period, these train operating companies and the rolling stock leasing companies and the subcontractors made £500 million pounds of profit in the worst year for rail revenue. So what Grant Shapps is actually doing is subsidising private sector profit, dividends and shares. Two of the companies that I'm dealing with in this dispute, First Group and Go Ahead, are subject to takeover bids of billions of pounds. They're really attractive to private sector investors and they want to take them over because they know that there's going to be profit even while the railway is subsidised. It's not actually true that they have been subsidised to that level. Before COVID, they were subsidised by 6.4 billion. And then in the COVID period, they had to add to that to keep it open because there was no revenue. And what these train operating companies said was, if you don't give us money through the emergency measures, we are going to give you the keys back so that the state can run the railway. And that would have been a more efficient way to run it, actually, because that would have saved £500 million of profit that's going out to these companies. So you can't have it both ways. He's claiming that uh, workers are subsidised while he's subsidising dividends and shares. Well, um, do you ever worry, with the big strikes happening, that there's a risk that you're overplaying your hand? Grant Shapps has said, and he said the programme earlier, that workers shouldn't risk striking themselves out of a job. We know that the government is looking at changing some of the legislation around strikes so that you know, it's easier for workers to come in to cover uh, striking workers, also potentially increasing the damages that companies can get back from unions for illegal strikes. Do you worry...? Well, we don't take part in illegal strikes. This is a lawful ballot conducted under this Tory government's anti-union legislation. But do you think that you might be overplaying your hand and well, that you're basically going to battle with the government and there will be a backlash to well, it? Well, if we don't play our hand, thousands of my members will lose their jobs. Railway services will be cut back. The safety regime that has been in place for a good deal of time will be cut back. 50% of the maintenance on the railway infrastructure is scheduled to be cut so that it can cut 3,000 of our members' jobs. So we have to fight this because we haven't had any pay rises. We're, we're faced with thousands of job cuts and they want to rip up our terms and conditions in a form of fire and rehire that's internal to the railway. It's just as ruthless as P&O, really, but they haven't got agency workers to come in. So they're saying to our people, you will have to entirely change the way you work. And if you're a new entrant, you'll have to work longer and for less money. And what they've also thrown on the table this week in both London Underground and the Railway Pension Scheme is that the pensions of our members are going to be decimated. They're going to make us poorer, not only while we're at work, but poorer in retirement. And that's an agenda that the government has got because they want to subsidise the private sector in this country, as they are doing in the health service, 
which is being consumed by the private sector, as they've done in the education service, which is being consumed by the private sector, all of which are farming subsidy direct into their dividends and shareholdings. Well, it's pretty clear that you're not going to back away from strike action uh, sitting here. It's, it, that is uh, more than clear. I just want to throw well, We're forward. available to negotiate, Sophie. This, this nonsense wanna... that we didn't attend uh, negotiations yesterday, which Grant Shapps has just said on your programme, is an entire fabrication. We left Network Rail on Friday night at around half past seven, and they said to us, we are prepared to meet you on Sunday. They never mentioned any negotiations on Saturday because they were going to speak to the Department for Transport about that, what they might be able to discuss with us. So he's lying? So he's making it up. He's lying? Well, he's making it up. What he's saying is untrue. We didn't in, in, attend a rally instead of negotiations. There were no negotiations scheduled and the train operating companies have not spoken to me or any of my officials since Thursday at lunchtime. Throwing forward, could we see more strikes over the summer and, and what kind of consequences could they have? Grant Shapps are saying that, look, freight will still be running, we're not in a situation where, you know, the lights could go out. Is he right? Well, I don't want the lights to go out. Nobody from my side of the, of the situation has said the lights will go out. We know they will run a train service using replacement labour, many of whom are unqualified to do the work and have had very short uh, two or three hour training programmes to, we could to do see safety critical multiple work. Multiple strikes throughout there, the rest of the year. If there's not a settlement, we will continue our campaign. I know that the ASLEF, uh, another union, is balloting their members and their returns on July the 11th. The TSSA, which is largely a management union in the railway, is also balloting their members in Network Rail and in many of the train operating companies. It's likely that Unite, that has some engineering members in the railway, will also ballot. But I think there are going to be many unions balloting uh, across the country because people can't take it anymore. We've got people who are, who are doing full-time jobs who are having to take state benefits and use food banks. That is a national disgrace. And Grant Shapps... It's fairly blasé about that. He's claiming that everybody on the railway is overpaid and sitting around doing nothing. Our members, the median wage in this dispute is £31,000. Many of the people on strike next week are earning as low as 18000 and typically many of them are earning in the mid-20s for full-time jobs working shifts around the clock. You think this is a class struggle, class war? Well, there's a class aspect to everything in the economy. There are lower-paid people and there are wealthy people in this society. And what's wrong in this society is that there is an imbalance between the people that do the work to keep this country going, who create the wealth of our civilization and don't get a fair share of that wealth because it's going to people who are vastly wealthy. Where do you think Labour are currently on this class struggle? I don't know where Labour are. If somebody could tell me where Labour are, I'd be very happy to hear it. I think they're triangulating between what they think is public opinion in the likes of the Daily Mail and the commentariat in this country. But what they've got to do, and what I want them to do, and I want Keir Starmer to be successful, and I want him to be our next Prime Minister, is, con is get back in contact with working people. Working people are suffering. There's really poor employment practice in this country. Many people are in vulnerable jobs with low pay. And he's got to come up with a programme that identifies himself and the Labour Party's policies directly with those working people so that they can get behind him and the trade union movement can get fully behind him. I mean, where's Streeting? The Shadow House Secretary reportedly apologised in Shadow Cabinet for saying that if he was an RMT member, he would be voting for strike action. Well, if he, anyone was an RMT member, they'd be voting for strike action. You look at the ballot. We had 89% of our members But do you think that Labour should be more comfortable about saying that publicly, if that's what they Labour think? should be comfortable with backing working-class people who are struggling. And one of the ways that they can redress the imbalance is through industrial action, where negotiations fail. What else are we to do? Are we to plead? Are we to beg? We want to bargain for our futures. We want to negotiate. And if we're not bargaining, you have to beg. And I don't want any working-class people in this country to have to beg the employers for a decent living. And Keir Starmer shouldn't want that either. So if we don't have industrial action and we don't have that uh, attempt to rebalance society, what is it we do? Do we just accept mass redundancies and our people getting poorer year by year, which is the situation since Cameron and Osborne got elected? Public sector workers have been robbed of wages whether they're in the military, the police force, the health service, the care service, education, 
All of those people are getting poorer every year. And it's this government that's responsible for it. And if Keir Starmer can't find the imagination to find which side of the equation he needs to be on, he needs to think about where the Labour Party is going. And I hope he can succeed in that. You say that you would like him to be the next Prime Minister. Do you think he's on track to be the next Prime Minister? Well, I hope so. I want a Labour government. I want a Labour government that can deliver uh, a pro-working people agenda. And that means a lot of things. It means funding the public services properly, but it also means reconfiguring our cities and our towns so that our people can get decent council housing. It means we have a good transport system, it means we have a good environment, and the railways are a key part of that. But in many of our towns and villages and cities, people are cut off by high transport fares, by high service costs for everything that they do. Now, he's got to find a way of creating policies that address that situation. Is he and doing I hope it? he can succeed. Well, he hasn't produced policies. They're in that position where they're in perdo, as they call it, on policy. But I think he's got to come out with some policies that show he's on the side of working people. OK, thank you very much for being on the programme uh, again. Uh, the man uh, there uh, who is, uh, of course, uh, calling those strikes next week. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Boris Johnson's ethics advisor resigned this week after he was asked for his view on plans that could have broken international trade laws. Lord Gite has previously expressed disappointment over the controversial refurbishment of the Prime Minister's flat and the Partygate scandal, but this seemed to be the final straw. Now, we're going to talk now to the Conservative MP, John Penrose, who offered some criticism of the Prime Minister when he resigned as his anti-corruption czar just a couple of weeks back. Uh, thank you very much for being uh, with us. Can you just firstly remind our viewers on why you felt you had to resign from your post? Well, mine was a little bit different from Lord Guyte, although Lord Guyte, I think, has since agreed with me with his resignation letter. What I was saying was that when the Prime Minister responded to the Sue Gray report, he was urged to come up with a reply which addressed whether or not um, the Sue Gray report said that he'd broken the ministerial code or not. And he was very, very focused on whether or not he'd broken the ministerial code by being issued with a fixed penalty notice, if you remember, by the police, didn't really address the main uh, criticism in the Sugre report, which was the failure of leadership, as Sugre des described it as the report said. And, of course, leadership at number 10, uh, the, the culture, the, the organisation that allowed all those parties to happen, um, is one of the central seven principles of integrity in public life. They're called the Nolan Principles. They run like a stick of rock right the way through the middle of the, the ministerial code. And, and it was pretty hard, I thought, to conclude that the Prime Minister wasn't being criticised for breaking the ministerial code. And when he didn't really address that, I just felt I had to go. But um, I, I'm, I'm very sorry that it came to that. Obviously, it wasn't a, a decision which I took very lightly. Um, but that was my reason. And I think that Lord Geit actually backed it up. It's one of the points he made in his letter uh, when, he re when he resigned uh, uh, earlier on this week. You say that, Lord Guy, you felt backed up that principle, but to be honest, I think most people would find it a bit more easy to get their heads around, I guess, if Lord Guy had resigned for the reasons that you did. Um, you know, he, he didn't go uh, over the parties at number 10 or over the flat refurbishment. Instead, it seemed like he decided to quit after a request for advice about tariffs on Chinese steel. I mean, it doesn't really feel like a smoking gun, does it? Well, and that's been the sort of the, the big open question. You're absolutely right. I mean, everyone's been reading his letter. He's since published a, a further cl clarification, but there's an awful lot of missing details about precisely what it was that he was being asked to uh, to, to, to opine on. Um, and so that's still sort of an, an open question, which I think people will still be looking for answers for, because no one can quite understand why a trade deal might involve a breach of the ministerial code or not. So that's still an, an outstanding uh, and uh, an open question, which we, we don't know the answer to yet. Do you think that really, uh, you know, part of the reason that he went is because of, of a build-up, I guess, uh, over uh, things like the ministerial code and how it applies to uh, Partygate and receiving that fine? It, it was pretty clear from his letter, yes, that this was, if you like, the, the, the final straw that broke the camel's back um, and that he'd been sort of getting more and more uncomfortable over time. One of the things that made him uncomfortable, as I said, was the reason why I resigned um, about a week earlier. Um, but you know, ultimately, we will have to see whether or not he... he there's any more clarification he can he can offer, um, or indeed whether or not Parliament wants to see what it was that he was being asked to to opine on. Um, but we'll have to wait and see about that one. As you say, still many questions to be answered. I think. 
Uh, now, one of the reasons I was keen to talk to you about this uh, subject today uh, is because it feels as if number 10, well, they have said that they're now reviewing uh, the post of ethics advisor in its entirety. Do you think they might scrap it? Well, I hope they won't. I think that the eth ethics advisor does something really important. And while it's quite possible you do need to update and, and upgrade and modernise these things every once in a while, it's quite possible to um, amend it a bit. I think that if they do anything other than strengthen it, then I think uh, you know, the, the, they will lose a lot of credibility um, and they will also miss out on a job that urgently needs to be done. I think uh, the last few months clearly demonstrate that it has to happen. So yes, there are a couple of things they could do to improve it, to strengthen it, to modernise it, um, but scrapping it is not part of that. Do you think that part of it might be driven for the fact that it might be quite difficult to get anybody to do the job? Well, I think, lost two ethics yeah. advisors now. Well, I, I think that there will be an issue with finding the, uh, somebody, yes. Um, but I think that if they strengthen the role, I've, I've made a couple of suggestions about how that might happen. It becomes more doable if you make it stronger and therefore it will become, I think, more attractive to the kind of sturdily independent, high caliber person they're going to need to have to give the, the role credibility and therefore to sort of restore the credibility in this area of the ministerial code and of number 10. So yes, it can be done. Um, but they'll need to strengthen it in order to make it attractive to the right kind of person. The right kind of person being someone who will stand up to Boris Johnson, is that what you mean? Yes, absolutely. And not just to Boris Johnson. The, the whole point about this role is that they need to be willing to stand up to any prime minister, um, you know, whoever they may be, Boris Johnson or any of his successors over the next you know, 10, 20, 30 years. You've got to have somebody who isn't afraid to speak truth to power. Uh, now, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the uh, confidence uh, motion. 148 MPs, of course, voting to say they had no confidence in the Prime Minister. We heard from Grant Shapps uh, earlier on the programme, who quite interestingly said he predicted that number and was just one out uh, in his prediction, uh, which is quite uh, remarkable, actually. Uh, but he was making the point that he thinks now most people want everyone to move on, uh, for the Prime Minister to focus on doing the job, looking at the situation in Ukraine, etc. Is that analysis correct? Or do you think that uh, a significant number of Conservative MPs are still harbouring those concerns about his leadership? Well, I think that the, the, the by winning the vote, even though I'm sure he would have wanted to win it but much more handily and with a bigger margin, but by winning the vote, I think the Prime Minister has won himself a bit of time. Um, and people like me and others, we have to respect the result of that vote. We have to accept it and respect it. And, and I think everybody does. And that means that the Prime Minister's got a little bit of time to you know, deliver the reset that he's already said he wants to do. He knows he's got to build some, you know, rebuild some bridges, if you like. So he's, he said he wants to do that. And I think that's entirely the right thing for him to do. But I don't think that rebuilding bridges will just involve ignoring the issue because I don't think ethics works that way. I don't think that integrity works that way. I think you've got to show that you're changing what you're doing and you're changing how you do it in order to address the concerns. You can't just ignore them and pretend it didn't happen. Uh, the Mail on Sunday are reporting today uh, that some MPs are looking at potentially changing the rules around confidence uh, motions uh, so that another one could be held after six months. Is that correct? Well, I think that would be a decision for uh, Sir Graham Brady, who, who runs the, the 1922 committee, which is kind of like the, the, the trade union, if you like, for, for Conservative MPs. Um, and I, my guess is that what he would say, I think he's actually said this publicly, is that there's not much point in changing the rules unless it's quite likely that another vote would come up with a different result. Um, so I think it would require quite a lot of uh, Conservative MPs who voted in favour of the Prime Minister in the last vote to come to him privately and say, look, I've changed my mind. And only at that point it would make very much sense. Otherwise, you're just sort of going through sort of party constitutional hoops for no very good practical purpose. And, and, and what's the point of that? But it would be uh, possible to do uh, if enough Conservative MPs indicated that they'd like to see another one. Well, at that point, there's a process and, and uh, there'd have to be a vote and stuff like that. But yes, you, you could do it. Um, but I think that uh, everyone is playing that one quite carefully and not wanting to sort of fan the, the flames of that idea, just because there's not much point. Um, if, if the reset works, if the Prime Minister persuades people, if he rebuilds the bridges that he said he wants to do, um, then it all becomes a bit sort of a, of a theoretical argument, I think is the point. OK, that makes sense. Uh, thank you very much for being on the programme uh, this morning. John Penrose there.
Uh, John Penrose there. Well, let's turn now to the war in Ukraine because Prime Minister Boris Johnson made a second visit to Kyiv this week uh, as the relentless fighting grinds on in the Donbass region. Now, on this programme, we've had a series of interviews with some incredibly impressive uh, Ukrainian uh, women. You know, as the men uh, fight, it has been really the women of Ukraine leading the political and diplomatic uh, push. And our next guest uh, is certainly uh, in that bracket. Uh, we're joined now live from Kyiv by the Ukrainian MP Ivana klimpush tinzatsky who was the former vice prime minister of the country and is now chair of the Parliamentary Committee on Integration of Ukraine to the EU. Thank you so much for being with us. It's my pleasure. To, Thank you for having me. Just, I just want to start talking about the current situation in Ukraine. Um, it feels like the fighting is really intensifying uh, in the Donbass region. Um, what is your update on what the situation is? Yes, unfortunately, there is um, fearful fighting ongoing in the east of the country and unfortunately also bombardments of uh, cities across the country uh, are continued by Russian Federation. Also, uh, fighting is ongoing in the northern eastern part and, and southern part of Ukraine. So the situation is not getting easier on us and that's why for us uh, it's extremely important that there is a continued stream of uh, military military support coming to Ukraine uh, because the urgency, the quality and the quantity of the weaponry that could be provided by our partners is basically critical for our ability to withheld this, um, this attacks. It feels as if much of the story of the war so far has been about Ukrainian success in repelling forces from Kyiv, uh, in taking back some territory uh, more recently. Are you concerned that as Russia focuses on the east of the country, that narrative might be changing? You know, uh, it's not about the narrative. We don't have uh, many options on the table. We have to survive in this war that uh, when the aggressor has come to erase us from the map of the world and we want to live and want to build our country and want to preserve our nation. So uh, therefore we have to win. Um, and that might require all resolve, that might require all our ability to fight uh, and, and a lot, unfortunately. It already takes a lot, a lot of, of Ukrainian, best Ukrainians' lives um, from the military and also from the civilians. Um, so therefore, um, it's not about the narrative. We have to push it, uh, push it against Russian feder Federation. And yes, unfortunately, at this particular moment, when Russia has gathered all its military capacity in the in the east of the country, uh, we are losing some of the territories, and um, and and they are. Um, staying in the, at this particular moment in the, the hands of occupiers. But we hope there will be a moment and the possibility for us to, to get those territories and people back. You're talking about uh, the need for more weapons, for more uh, supplies from uh, the West. What is the situation uh, with supplies? There have been some reports about people even running out of ammunition. Well, the supplies are coming in and we are extremely grateful for all those nations that are making this effort and that are um, also sh showing example to those who have been hesitating or who have been much slower uh, on this track. But at this particular moment, definitely, this is still not enough for us to have the uh, enough artillery capability, enough uh, um, multiple uh, launch rocket systems capability to fight back all that, uh, all those rockets and artillery and tanks that that are um, coming from Russian Federation. They are not counting the, they are not counting the munitions. They they have just uh, more than enough. While sometimes, unfortunately, in some of the areas, the ratio of our weaponry is one to ten with the Russians. Yeah, that really is a pretty stark um, example there, that, that ratio that you've just given to us. There's been a bit of criticism from some, about some European countries about being too slow uh, to show support for Ukraine. Do you feel that that's changed this week uh, with the news from the EU that you've been given membership candidate status and also, of course, the visit uh, to Ukraine uh, from the leaders of Germany, France and Italy? 
I think it was very important visit um, of those of those leaders of the EU, and uh, very important that they have finally made up their minds uh, to support the candidacy of Ukraine uh, to join the the European Union. However, I would. Uh, also like to, to underline that does, that uh, that decision uh, which I think is um, is totally you know right thing to do at this particular moment for Ukrainian people and for Ukrainian state um, should not dismiss the other needs of of, uh, of our country and those are um, we call it I call it as a major humanitarian aid for Ukraine in terms of um, actually getting weaponry Unfortunately, we are not getting enough from those uh, particular states. And, um, well, like, like Germany has been giving smaller weaponry, and uh, we understand that that was already a big change in their policy. But uh, so far, heavy weaponry does not come really from, from, from that country. And I think it's a big mistake of Germany trying to kind of postpone those decisions uh, so far. But I hope that after, you know, Chancellor Scholz and after the, the uh, other leaders have actually seen the uh, ruins and destruction that uh, Russians have uh, have brought on our land near near Kyiv uh, with their own eyes. Maybe that could change their actually personal um, readiness to take the decisions on additional weaponry for for us to protect yeah. because we are protecting ourselves. And how does it contrast with the UK? Uh, Boris Johnson, of course, made his visit second visit to Kyiv this week. You know, we uh, extremely appreciate um, his visits and his real, uh, very clear stance on the need to support uh, Ukraine by the free uh, world, by free countries. And we are uh, we are grateful for his leadership. I think uh, to an extent, maybe his visit has kind of balanced the, the need to talk and prioritize the security and, and the military assistance at this particular moment in comparison to what the other leaders uh, the day before have been uh, talking about. So we would like others to, to also um, follow the path and follow the, the example of, of Britain in terms of Britain and the US uh, in terms of helping us with the, with the weaponry. And just finally, you know, I've been talking to you as a politician so far, and I'd like to kind of finish by talking to you as a mother. Um, I've you know, read some of your interviews previously, and I think you're a mum of teenagers. And I just wonder how it is for you, um, you know, having the children in the middle of a war. How do you parent? How do you explain to them what is going on? And how do you make them feel reassured? Uh, thank you for asking. I think this is probably the, the most challenging part of our jobs today, so to say, um, to, to ensure that, um, that they are getting that support that, uh, and, and that we are there for them uh, because we, we cannot, unfortunately, spend enough time with our kids um, at all at this particular moment when you are preoccupied uh, with serving the country and you actually sometimes you have to actually choose the the responsibility um, in front of the country uh, as a first and major option and then and then going um, going and helping um, even psychologically or you know emotionally helping your children but we are trying to to do that all of us uh, who are moms uh, in uh, who are in the parliament or in the governmental positions uh, it's tough. They are, I think, uh, the generation of our kids. That's uh, my feeling from what my, my daughters are telling me. Uh, one is 16, another is 19. Um, and the, this is the generation that will not forgive Russians. Um, in, in the, the, the destruction, the death, the, uh, the, the pain that they have brought on our land. And it's not because we are teaching uh, them this. It's because what they are watching and how they are watching uh, the situation developing and how they are becoming, um, you know, very... Uh, Full, full, they are full of pain. Uh, they are full of desire to engage and to help. So they are volunteering for for different things and 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 trying to do their their least uh, at least something that they can do uh, their most uh, to 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 help also the armed forces. And that's um, I think shows also the the incredible unity of the of the society because uh, the society is comprised of of those little tiny bits um, and little human stories uh, that they have. And 
you know, I hope they can come back to to Kiev. They are not in Kiev in this particular moment. They really want to go to to come back home. Uh, but uh, so far, we do not feel that it is safe enough for them to be to be home. So really, I uh, hope that situation changes for you uh, soon, and that you know, Kiev is thank safe you. enough for your daughters to return. Um, thank you so much for talking to us uh, this week. Thank you. Thank you.